Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. And in this week's episode, we're going to be talking about a cancel culture story. This being Quillette, it's hardly the first time we've covered the topic, but this one comes with a twist. In a lot of stories about social justice mobs coming after someone innocent, the cry you hear is that if the victim only had received due process, they would have been vindicated. Well, in this story, the victim did get due process, and they were indeed vindicated, but then they were cancelled anyway. Okay, so to set the scene, it's the Solomon R. Guggenheim Art Museum in New York, and our protagonist is Nancy Spector, the Guggenheim's former artistic director and chief curator. As one would expect of a high-ranking Manhattan art world grandee, Miss Spector is progressive in her politics, and just a few years ago became quite excited about bringing an exhibit to the Guggenheim centered around the celebrated black artist Jean-Michel Basquiat, and in particular a painting that Basquiat did to protest the apparent police killing of a fellow black artist named Michael Stewart. And in organizing the exhibit at the Guggenheim, Miss Spector partnered with a young black Basquiat scholar named Chadria Labouvier. The idea was that Labouvier would help curate the event with the help of Miss Spector and Miss Spector's staff. Museum visitors would see an important painting channeling themes concerning social justice, and the Guggenheim would take a step toward diversifying its largely white culture through this collaboration with an up-and-coming young black female curator. But things went off the rails. As my guest today, Atlantic Magazine writer Helen Lewis, recently recounted in a long and definitive article on the controversy, Miss Labouvier felt slighted during the exhibit preparation process, and began accusing the Guggenheim, and Miss Spector in particular, of acting in a racist manner. The whole thing got very nasty, then settled down for a while, but then blew up again in mid-2020, following the murder of George Floyd. At this point, the Guggenheim brought in investigators and diversity consultants to test the claims that Miss Spector was presiding over a racist atmosphere. What they found in the end was that Miss Spector was completely innocent, yet that didn't save her Guggenheim career. As Miss Lewis will discuss in the conversation with me that follows, the Guggenheim seems to have needed a scapegoat to absorb all of the nasty things being said about the museum, and not just about race. I think a lot of people think of the museum industry as very staid. It's become quite politicized in recent years, wouldn't you say? I think it to some extent has always been politicized, but it particularly interested me because I come from what I think of as a left-leaning background, but um, a more economically left-wing background, I guess, than where current museum politics has ended up. So one of the things I wanted to get at in the article was the fact that, you know, you have these incredibly rich museums with these multi-million dollar endowments but they're also trying to be the people who are trying to make headway on cutting edge social issues, which is always going to be slightly awkward. So, yeah, I mean, in Britain, for example, there's been a big push here to decolonize the collections, as it's called, to, you know, when you put up a display with maybe stuff from the 18th century, you mentioned that Britain was heavily involved in the slave trade during that time. You know, all of those kind of things are now creeping into to art um, to kind of deal particularly with the legacy of colonialism. And certainly in the case of Britain, you know, our museums are full of stuff that we nicked from other people under dubious circumstances or purchased bargain rates. So there has been a, a long route to atoning for, for some of that, or at least reckoning with that, which I'm not entirely opposed to. But it has become this idea that, you know, museums are not just warehouses for objects value they are part of a political project which is not I think how they would have maybe seen themselves quite so much 20 years ago. Could you tell us a little bit about the painting which is the subject of this it's called the death of Michael Stewart so I confess I'd never heard of Michael Stewart quite a tragic incident and this happened of course decades before the George Floyd tragedy can you give us a little bit of the backstory on that? Yeah so in the 1980s there is a young street artist called Michael Stewart who is arrested at the First Avenue Stubway Station, which no longer exists, and is essentially probably beaten to death by police. He certainly dies in police custody. And this is something that really energizes the New York City's street art community, including Jean-Michel Basquiat, who has 
very recently become, uh, you know, an absolutely enormous commercially selling artist. You know, he's got paintings been bought by Jay-Z, for example, in the latest Tiffany commercial with Beyonce and Jay-Z, there's a Basquiat in the background. And, you know, the sense was among those street artists, well, this could have been us because the premise for why he was arrested was that he was tagging the subway. And so there's this big outpouring among the New York City art scene. And Basquiat's contribution to it on the wall of Keith Herring's studio is this painting called Defacement, the Death of Michael Stewart, which has these two pink, I think, pig-like figures with their batons raised. And then the word defacement above it and the idea is essentially what's the bigger defacement you know writing something on a subway wall or wiping out a human life with police brutality it's hard to imagine that promoting a piece of art connected to this would in any way be controversial could you explain how that came to be well the painting was essentially rediscovered after having been in a private hands for a long time by a young curator it was on keith herring's studio wall and then he died young too he died of aids it was cut out of the wall and then was in private hands by the daughter of a very prominent art collector held it it was essentially kind of rediscovered by this young curator called Chadria de Bouvier, whose parents had been Basquiat fans. They'd had some of his drawings when she was growing up. And she also had a personal connection to this issue in that her brother was killed by police during an arrest. No one was ever prosecuted in that case. So she found that she staged a small exhibition just of this painting at her old college where Nancy Spector, the senior curator at the Guggenheim, saw it and said, essentially, come into our building and bring this into the Guggenheim. We'll surround it with other stuff about the scene at the time, you know, other paintings by Michael Stewart, things related to it. And I think from Nancy Spector's perspective, it was both an interesting artistic point of view. You know, Basquiat is now a very hot artist and also a, a political gesture. You know, it was it was playing into the idea that Black Lives Matter had made everybody much more aware and interested in police racism. And this would be the, the Guggenheim's kind of statement on that. Has Miss Spector been criticised for any of what you just described or did that come about later? No, I don't think she got criticised for any of that. She did get criticised because the Trump White House contacted her and asked if the, they would loan, the Guggenheim would loan a Van Gogh to the White House. And instead she offered them Maurizio Catalan's America, which is a solid gold toilet. And, you know, it was a deliberately calculated insult to the Trump team. People in the museum, as far as I understand it, absolutely loved it. They liked her putting up two fingers um, to the Republican Party and the Trump administration. So, you know, I think at the time that Shadri Le Bouvier arrived to work at the Guggenheim on this exhibition, you know, Nancy Spector was feeling pretty good about being a kind of liberal hero. And can you tell me a little bit about her background? Because she's a major character in this. About Nancy Spector? Yeah. She has been at the Guggenheim for the majority of her career, several decades now. And, and senior creator is the most senior artistic, you know, curatorial position there. She left for a little bit to go to the Brooklyn Museum. You know, I think there may have been some kind of office politics involved in that her return slightly put some noses out of joint from people who, you know, thought they were on the next step up and then she came back and it turned out they weren't. So I think, you know, one of the things that's consistently comes across to me, I don't know about you when you cover some of these quote unquote council culture stories, is that there's often a lot going on in terms of personal drama, psychodynamics, institutional dynamics that isn't really captured by the alleged, you know, race, gender, whatever it might be, controversy that it's supposed to be about. And I think some of that was was definitely happening. You know, the Guggenheim had got this younger activist staff, which is something we see in lots of these cases, you know, who were very politicized. And they did want, you know, the museum to to become less white and less, you know, the kind of plaything of of capitalists. You know, running alongside all of this story is the incredible meta story of the the Sackler money, you know, the the dynasty the behind uh, Oxycontin and, and opiates. And the fact that basically every major art museum in the world had a Sackler wing, Sackler library, Sackler workspace, Sackler commission. And all of that was paid for on the backs of essentially mostly poor white people in America who were addicted to painkillers. And so there's been a very painful reckoning in the art world about, you know, where is all our money coming from? You know, who are these names that are on the walls? Some of which I think is entirely justified. And some of which I think has spilled over into a sort of very aggressive, hyper-politicized idea of what an art museum should be. Sometimes these episodes have deeper roots than at first is reported. Going back to 2016, some staff members expressed frustration that the museum was not doing more to signal its opposition to Trump, which makes sense from the point of view if you imagine people who work in any sort of high art subculture, it's not a mystery that they would probably not be Trump fans. But it does seem kind of odd that people at a museum would think it's their job to signal opposition to a politician they don't like. I think with the benefit of hindsight, it does look 
questionable. You know, I always think of that Michael Jordan quote, you know, Republicans buy sneakers too. I think lots of people have had to kind of come to the realization that they, you know, they aren't necessarily part of a political project or their job isn't part of a political project. The same thing happened in journalism, in, in liberal media, I think, you know, you ended up with the New York Times and the Washington Post, both and the Atlantic, to be fair, putting on an enormous amount of subscribers who really did feel that these were, you know, they wanted them to be kind of bastions of opposition. And, you know, that's not necessarily how those institutions saw themselves. Um, so there was always a little bit of, of tension there. But I think publishing had the same idea. You know, um, universities had the same idea that, you know, were they going to be new, politically neutral spaces or were they going to be activist spaces? And that tension you just saw playing out all across America, you know, from 2016 onwards. I think that when you're talking about the deep roots, the other one that really struck me in this story is is COVID. So after the initial kind of blow up happens, um, you know, Le Bouvier and Spectre fall out, the accusations are made, that's in 2019. And it all seems to have blown over. And what reheats it is the combination of both the terrible murder of George Floyd and then the corporate response to that, you know, the, the kind of Instagram blackout Tuesday, you know, all of these people posting their black squares, you know, standing with um, Black Lives Matter. And that's when Shadri Labouvier tweets again saying this has been the most racist experience of her professional life. And that is the whoomp, you know, the blue touch paper that turns this into a huge PR crisis for the Guggenheim. But I think that is absolutely part of that is the fact that everyone is stuck at home people have been furloughed they may be worried there's there a job for them to come back to they know some cuts are coming they're worried about dying of a you know disease they're at home they can't even speak to their colleagues look them in the eye you're having these you know this extraordinary zoom meeting that i talk about where there's sort of 200 people on it and people start crying yeah. you know there's a real kind of fever pitch I think that some of these institutions got themselves into in that summer you know a, a comparable incident probably being the the New York Times publishing the op-ed by Senator Tom Cutton about the idea that you would need to send in the army um, in order to deal with riots and the way that that led to the ousting of James Bennett at the New York Times you know there there was a, an inability of management to kind of contain staff when they were not physically there you know and I think these things did become um, much more heightened as a result of that. Some of the most radicalized sectors, if you look at universities, it's like medieval studies or library sciences, or in this case, you have museum curation. Is it a kind of desperate casting about to be involved in what they see on social media, uh, like a kind of professional version of FOMO? That's not how I see it. I, you know, there's a great saying about student politics, which is that it gets so tense because the stakes are so low. Right. And I think that there is a point with some of those disciplines you're talking about are incredibly small and therefore competitive. You know, there are whatever it is, you know, a dozen tenured professorships in medieval studies. Okay, so if you're one of the low paid junior faculty members, what's the thing that you can do to distinguish yourself? And it's maybe be, you know, the most activist, be the most interested in diversity, equity and inclusion. That's a way as well as your academic credentials that you can kind of distinguish yourself from the pack. There's also a great incentive to you to fail any particular tenured professor, right? Given that is, you know, I always think these things a bit like the sort of Vatican in the 1500s. There is a kind of dead man's shoes model of, of advancement. So I don't think you should exclude the economics of it. And also all the sectors you're mentioning are really interesting to me because they are ones that are seen as culturally extremely prestigious and desirable, but also essentially at their entry levels, extremely badly paid. So these curatorial assistants, you may be having to come in as interns unpaid, living in New York, an incredibly expensive city to live in. Um, you know, and the promise is that one day they'll get a really great job, but only kind of one wildebeest is going to make it across the plane without being savaged by lions. And you have to be that that one that does that. And, and, you know, and I think to some extent, journalism, academia, publishing, these are all the same. I think it's, you know, if you're in uh, Silicon Valley or if you're in a financial services, the you know, and, and your employer says to you, OK, but you can't bring your politics into work. But would you like another hundred thousand dollars in pay? A lot more people are going to think that, you know, I'm just here to do my work and I shut up. But, you know, you were essentially, if you're a middle-class kid going into one of these more elite industries, forsaking the ability to make lots of money. So what the reason that people do it is because they they care about politics. And I think that's definitely part of it. You know, one of the things that's always really interesting to me about newspapers and magazines is that the developers are often more radical than the journalists who often come up through this tradition of 
objectivity or fairness, whatever it might be. And I often think that's possibly because the developers have turned down the opportunity to make an absolute mint at Google or Facebook because they have a kind of social conscience and they want to do a job that has, you know, what they see as a beneficial effect on the world. And that means that they are self-consciously activist in a way that they probably wouldn't be if they were working at Meta, or even though they'd be living in a house made of gold. Miss Spectre seems like an unlikely villain. You describe her as somebody who grew up middle-class Jewish family in, in Albany, of all places, and she's only four foot 11. As you say, she'd been navigating the art world and particularly the Guggenheim her entire life. Do you think she was somebody whose background and personality armed her to deal with this kind of situation? From everything that I heard about her, she was incredibly conscientious and hardworking and nervy. But I think that, you know, you can say upper, upper, upper middle class, whatever it might be. But you have to remember that there are people in these gallery spaces who are absolutely loaded, whether that is, you know, they're from a kind of wasp elite or whether or not they're married to somebody who is, you know, senior vice president or wherever. So there is a kind of aristocracy there of people. And she wasn't part of that. She was a somebody who had made her own way up. And I think that's definitely part of the dynamic too. You know, what powerful allies did she have outside the museum? You know, from the artists that I talked to, she certainly was loved by a great deal of the artists that she worked with who really appreciated her her care and her interest. But she wasn't somebody who could, you know, phone up somebody who would threaten to pull millions of pounds out of millions of dollars out of the museum if they fired her. So she didn't have that kind of leverage that some people perhaps in the in the art world do. La Bouvier, as part of her curatorial responsibilities, was invited to create this essay for the exhibit catalogue. And in the world of museum curation, I'm guessing this is an extremely important piece of text, right? Mm -hmm. It introduces people to the visual experience and it has to carry an air of authority. It's part of the branding of the museum. The reason I was fascinated by this particular spot in your piece is here in Canada, where I live, we've had episodes in which during our equivalent of the George Floyd moment, you've had activists who've been invited to become guest editors for an edition of a magazine or something. And they're not professional editors. So as you might imagine, their work needs to be corrected or suggestions need to be made. The people in charge have to decide between upholding professional standards and giving in to the politics of the moment. Am I kind of describing what happened when La Bouvier wrote her first draft of her exhibit essay? She did say in an interview with the New York Times around the exhibition that, you know, I was the only person of color who was involved in any of these discussions sometimes, you know. So I can see why there was an instinctive suspicion of going into this very white institution with a exhibition that focused on race and and feeling very much like an outsider but you know with even if you take the racial dynamics of it aside I mean you'll know this from being edited right it is a relationship of trust you have to believe that you and your editor are on the right. same side and that your editor is trying to get the best version of the piece that they possibly can and isn't trying to kind of subtly censor you and you know look at the way that Glenn Greenwald left The Intercept you know a publication that he co-founded that was about his feeling that the editor or real staff were trying to not let him say things that he wanted to say and that is a very easy thing that can happen, it, you know, particularly on these incredibly controversial subjects that people can feel that they're not allowed to say the things that they wanted to say, that their their editor is not working with them, their editor is working against them. And I think that is a totally reasonable assessment of how Shadrou Le Bouvier felt. And, you know, I... I talked to other people who were involved in that situation who said, you know, it wasn't up to scratch. And, you know, she didn't respond to our interview request, so she never got to make her side of the case. But and I don't think it's at all crazy to think that she handed in something that was written from the perspective of somebody who hadn't ever been a professional art curator in the way that, the, you know, the Guggenheim would have expected. And they said, we're going to have to tighten this up in this way, that way, the other way. And what she saw was a group of white people telling her about a subject that she had a personal attachment to. And it all spiraled out of control from there. I mean, just from my own experience of, I, you know, I, ha I have had times when I've been edited, not by the, uh, the Atlantic or the New Statesman, the two places I've worked at for the longest time, but other places where you can sense there are jokes they don't want to make you or things you don't want you to say. or And they, it gets camouflaged in these ways of, oh, that we think this will derail the piece. And you think it's actually because you don't want me to get you in trouble on Twitter, isn't it? So and it's a very delicate relationship. And I'm not surprised that it, during the time of incredible political sensitivity, that it was something that provoked, you know, that was the snowflake that caused the avalanche. That doesn't surprise me at all, really. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp, an online therapy service that can help you get to your best self. 
So anyone who follows me on social media or listens to these podcasts knows that I have a lot of stuff on the go. Family, writing, podcasting, gaming, culture war shenanigans. And while I try to put on a good-humored face during most of these escapades, the truth is that no one, including me, is immune from life's anxieties and hang-ups. And I've learned that talking to a therapist can help with these issues. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists, available 100% online. Plus, it's more affordable than other kinds of therapy. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with the therapist, and if things aren't clicking with one, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. There's no waiting rooms, no traffic to deal with, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash quillette. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash quillette. There are some incidents you describe here where she's kind of like waging war against the Guggenheim from within. You write, according to multiple sources, she tried to persuade other interviewees to withdraw from the project. That's the people she's interviewing for the show. And during this time, the museum is actually just trying to mollify her, renegotiating her fee and giving her sole credit for the catalog. She's also tweeting her complaints constantly. At one point, Le Bouvier had sort of a get-together at the museum, but had, hadn't alerted security beforehand. She described as a major breach for a museum employee that shocked other members of the curatorial department. You're describing behavior here that would get somebody fired from any professional organization. Did La Bouvier have the Guggenheim over a barrel and she could just kind of do anything and not get fired? Yeah, it's hard to know whether or not it was a panic situation or it was a genuine kind of shock. I think actually to some extent it was shock, right? It's a very hierarchical institution from everything that I've heard. You know, the junior creators do what they're told. You know, you think of the kind of Devil Wears Prada kind of setup, right? Where there's somebody who's in charge and everybody, like you wouldn't possibly imagine Anne Hathaway's character in Devil Wears Prada going and tweeting her complaints about Miranda Priestley. And that's how the Guggenheim operated. So they just, I think, had no idea how to deal with this kind of runaway train that was going on. And I think they constantly tried to kind of mollify her just in the sense, and I think this is what happens in a lots of cases when somebody becomes seen as a troublemaker, they're kind of subtly frozen out, which they sense and that puts them their back up even more but the kind of feeling is that you just want to keep passing the parcel so that you're not holding the parcel when the music stops that is my reading of what the Guggenheim tried to do was just hope that they could just get through it and obviously it didn't it didn't work out like that a Dane Guild situation um... <laughs> I always like the uh, the idea of the Dane Guild I think it's really interesting I think it happens in a lot of situations with institutions where they try and just yeah they try and mollify and appease and the trouble is that the demand just comes back greater and greater. And I think institutions in the last couple of years have certainly become better at saying no to people and not being kind of held hostage, even if that does mean a couple of days of bad headlines. But I feel like the summer of 2020 was not a time when anybody was willing to risk that because they could see all around them that the people who were doing that were coming a cropper. I mean, part of this is just the way language is used. You describe this episode that seems to sum everything up. Uh, there's a panel where she she described uh, what happened as, as violent. Um, you have weaponized a panel of black bodies to do your filth, I think is the phrase that um, Le Bouvier said in the, in the Q&A, yeah. And then later on, uh, Le Bouvier tweeted about how all this has been the worst professional episode of racism she'd ever endured. It seems almost comical, the use of this apocalyptic language to describe an institution bending over backwards in the name of race politics. What Was there nobody at these events willing to call out this use of language? Here you report that Elizabeth Dougal, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Uh, Dougal, then the COO of the Guggenheim, who was sitting next to Spectre during this spectacle, she stood up after Le Bouvier, I'm quoting here, and said that the museum, quote, does truly respect and appreciate your work, end quote. Uh, it, it's a sort of like, thank you, may I have another response? One gets the sense that Le Bouvier, she could have said anything in that instance. And Dougal would have just <laughs> said, hey, thanks for speaking your truth. Um, was, was this a situation where just language has no limits? I think it's going to be really funny when we look back in 10 years time at some of the language of the last couple of years, and it will just seem so unbelievably of its time, right? In the way that saying groovy and you know, immediately puts you in the 70s. But the, the constant refrain is always about that Le Bouvier was worried about her erasure from the conversation, you know, that her work wasn't being um, taken seriously enough or credited enough. And she would often call this violent erasure. You know, she'd say this was this was violence. 
And that to me is a usage that will immediately put everybody straight back into the, you know, late 2019s, early 20s, the idea that everything is violence when it's not actually violence. You know, again, along with other stuff, you know, um, Le Bouvier compared Spectre to the Central Park Karen, right? That's just one of those phrases that's just going to seem very of its time. Um, but yeah, it comes back to the analysis that I had before, which is I think what you're seeing in that panel is essentially like, if we just flatter her and mollify her, maybe she'll go away and this we can, you know, and, and this will be a controlled explosion rather than having the row in public. And these, this is the thing that's really interesting to me is these big, slightly sclerotic institutions just having this absolute paralysis when dealing with social media. And, you know, I think that applies to all kinds of other places. As you may or may not know, I was removed from a video game. <laughs> Uh, in like 2019 because of comments I've made about gender and the statement about it was really interesting because it was just like about my controversial comments absolutely no reference to what they were about or you know what was wrong with them was this the Grand Theft Auto thing Uh, this was Ubisoft this was uh, Watch Dogs Legion but the interesting thing to me about that whole episode was I don't think that Ubisoft a very big company but I think this part of it based in Canada had any idea who I was or what I'd said they just saw some angry people on Twitter and forums and they just kind of puked and and like the best thing to do was to get rid of me. And I think that's the story of lots of those. You know, I don't think they're about principled standing up for uh, minority rights. I think they're just a, a companies which are allergic to bad PR. Did you say something horrible like that biology exists? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've argued for you know the importance of single sex spaces. I have always said that I think trans women are women, trans men are men. But I have also said that I think that is you know, there's a qualitative difference between somebody who was raised, uh, born biologically male and raised male and then transitions uh, later on. And sometimes that is the most important thing in law rather than somebody's perception of themselves. And yeah, you know, that is, as you will know, considered to be a pretty alarming take by some people on online. And it's part of the kind of this this suite of, I think, overreactions by a kind of small band of activists that get taken very seriously by bad PR reverse companies. And for a while, there was absolutely no downside to chucking people under the bus. And now what's happened, I think, because so many of these incidents have happened, and that actually, there is now bad PR for people either way, right? They either are accused of standing by bigotry, or they're accused of being gutless. And that weirdly has made a lot of them more gutsy, because they, you know, there's not an easy out for them, they actually have to make a decision on the merits of what's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, if I knew beforehand that Helen Lewis was such a turf, I would never have conducted this interview. But here we are. I mean, it's very funny to me because I'm neither a particularly radical feminist nor am I trans-exclusionary in the classic sense of how that was originally worked. But yes, you're right. Like there are people who think that I should be exiled from every platform that there is and like made to go and sit in a box and think about my my sins. And, you know, it's 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 obviously something that's personally affected how <laughs> I cover these stories because I, you know, I don't think that being ostracized is a small thing. I mean, you know, you'll know this from your work too, right? It is personally very painful. And and, and people who are casual about that and they go, well, you know, you just, some people criticized you. Why are you being so sensitive? Um, I suspect are the kind of people who say all the things that they think are the right opinion because they never actually want that to happen to them. And so they've never had any experience of any kind of pushback from their own, you know, sort of circles and can therefore be quite glib about what that process is like. Helen Joyce was on our podcast a little while ago and I confessed to her that I just like saying the word turf because I think it's a funny word. <laughs> she is the spicier Helen. I mean, there are a lot of British Helens, but uh, we we kind of go, I'm like the Korma and she's like the Vindaloo. Or maybe Helen will become the next Karen. Please don't give people ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and now a message from the Commercial Break Comedy Podcast, which has got to be a commercially successful operation since they're the ones with enough money to advertise on the Quillette Podcast instead of vice versa. The Commercial Break features two longtime friends, Brian and Chrissy, who get together each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to tease out the absurd elements of modern life, of which, as we all know, there are many. It's one of Apple's top three improv comedy podcasts and is available on all major podcast players and at youtube.com slash the commercial break. Now, look, unlike at the Quillette podcast, you're not going to get a lot of black turtleneck stuff about, you know, the demise of liberalism, but you're going to get a lot more about important topics such as psychic readings gone awry and why would anyone want to date a ghost? And you're probably going to laugh a lot, which I like to think you do occasionally here at Quillette, but at the commercial break, that's the main point. The Commercial Break is available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, or you can visit tcbpodcast.com. That's tcb, 
thecommercialbreakpodcast.com or go to youtube.com slash thecommercialbreak. And now back to the Quillette podcast. The horrifying murder of George Floyd raised the temperature on a lot of conflicts. And La Bouvier went on Twitter and... This is, and this is where the line came, where she described working at the Guggenheim as the most racist professional experience of my life, and likened Nancy Spector to Amy Cooper, the so-called Central Park Karen. What happened after was, was more consequential, though, because on June 8th, so this is, I guess, maybe less than two weeks after George Floyd was murdered, diversity consultants who'd been hired by the museum, convened a Zoom meeting to discuss the situation with staff. And staff members were asked to sort themselves into gravel, paved, boulevard, and highway rooms, depending on how smoothly they felt able to navigate racial issues in the workplace. This area of consultancy seems to have a lot of metaphors attached to it. I confess I'd never heard this one. No, I'd never heard that one before. I mean, I think some of this stuff is is extremely cringeworthy and with the benefit of even of two years hindsight i think most people involved would just think what were we what was that all about you described by the end some some people were in tears and one one of these meetings went on for five hours in the absence of any kind of voice of reason people just kind of snowballed the accusations but then when it was time for specifics they couldn't come up with anything. Uh, you know, she said Spectre had once confused two East Asian staff members with each other. Yeah, and she praised uh, uh, the wonderful wonderful Caribbean lilt of a um, security guard who used to sing as... But he was he a went, singer. Right, right, and the museum itself had, had tweeted this out a couple of years ago, because so clearly, therefore, endorsing this as a... You know, two years ago, this was seen as, as something that was lovely to boast about a black member of staff's beautiful singing voice. This was the terms in which it was allowed to be described. Sometimes we talk about this cancel culture stuff as... Well, you know, they never got their day in court. What's weird about this case, Spectre did get her day. There was a, yeah, there was an investigation by an independent law firm that reviewed a huge number of documents. They reviewed 15,000 documents and messages. So this is the law firm Kramer Levin. Amazingly, Le Bouvier declined to be interviewed, saying it was, quote, not safe to do so. How does that happen? Yeah, and she's done Instagram stories since where she's talked about someone stealing the catalytic converter off her, her car. She does seem to think that there is, you know, that, that some suspicious things are happening to her and who knows might be behind them. The investigators found no evidence, this is a quote here from their report, no evidence that Miss Labouvier was subject to adverse treatment on the basis of her race. So the man from Mars looks at this and says, oh, great, I guess. So I guess Spectre is still at the job, right? No, and what happened was that she she left on the same day. You know, having been on sabbatical for three months, she left on the same day the report was published. And that's exactly why the piece, the idea for the piece always from the start and the headline on the piece was about the idea of the scapegoat. Because what happened was a lot of people were very unhappy with the institutional culture. They had these big pay disparities. They thought that, you know, there were favorites in the department. All of this kind of classic stuff that you probably find in almost every office. And somehow there was this sort of alchemical process over all these intensively long Zooms in which it was decided that, you know, that Nancy Spector essentially was the one who did it. And this is why I always go back to the, the play The Crucible, right, which is about communism and McCarthyism, is so brilliant because it sets up in the first half. What are the things that people are actually upset about? Now, one of the arguments that gets someone called a, a witch in that is the idea that they had taken possession of a bit of land that belonged to someone else. And this wasn't fair. This was this long running land dispute. Another is a woman who's had something like seven miscarriages with no explanation. And she's very jealous of a woman who's had loads of children. And then it just very subtly shows you what are the actual interpersonal dynamics that then get transmuted into this person's a bad person? And here's the thing that's very fashionable now that no one will question that I can attach to them as the reason to explain why I hate them. And I think that's what happened to, to Nancy Spector. There were all these other grievances going on and they got channeled into this vessel and then dumped on her and then she was ritually sacrificed and then the museum was able to go, thank God we've dealt with that. A new era is upon us. Were you surprised by the level of underlying animus that existed, even putting apart racial issues? Like, it seems like things were just very tense and there wasn't a lot of trust. Yeah, I think that was also entirely exacerbated by the economic situation, which was that, you know, lots of people have been put on furlough. They were often the, you know, lower paid people. And then there was a big, something like a 10% cut in headcount in that September of, of 2020. So people were obviously knowing that they were, you know, under the axe because the museum had just closed its doors. It wasn't making any income from tick-up sales. So, you know, people were worried about their jobs. And, you know... From the benefit of coming from a European perspective where the pandemic was, I think, 
much less polarizing. It seems to me that lots of bluish people in America were freaked out by COVID in a way that you didn't see as much, quite so much here, you know, and still are freaked out by COVID, which I think is related to the sense that they had no trust in the Trump administration to make the correct decisions for them. So you end up with these people who are kind of triple masking and they still haven't seen anybody indoors and it's, you know, after you now two and a half years or whatever. And so I think there was a sense of, you know, incredible political tension around these people who are mostly very strongly democratic, incredible worries about their health. And then you add on top economic worries. And one of the things I didn't put in the story was that some of these people were zooming in from, you know, their houses in the Hamptons. It became very clear about who was actually going to be absolutely fine in this pandemic. They were just getting their food delivered to them and having a really lovely time spending, you know, more time with their kids than they previously done. And who was trapped in a tiny little apartment in New York City, really worried that they were going to be laid off. And so I think that it has to be seen in the context of this, too. You asked La Bouvier for comment for your story. How did that go? Not well. Uh, I think it's a, probably a fair characterization of that. You know, the Atlantic has an extremely rigorous fact-checking process. You know, we'll always offer people the chance to respond to any allegations that we make. And that was exactly what, you know, I did to Le Bouvier and just sent her what I thought was a very neutral message saying, you know, this is what I'm writing about. Could we talk? And she saw that as a as an unreasonable demand. She saw it as a you know, straightforward demand. And she did very long thread about uh, her responses to me which you know included many versions of telling me to go fuck myself and you know that's entirely her prerogative I I think it's a shame because I would like to have got her side of the story right I think I got into journalism precisely because I want to understand people whose outlook is very different to my own and I think her outlook is very different to my own and I would love to have understood it from the inside but um no she made it pretty clear that 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 was not in fact going to happen well, she called you a clueless, rapacious white woman. The thing that came across really strongly is her feeling that journalism has to be something that the subjects are really happy with, that it's a sort right. of form of people telling their own personal stories, which, again, I think is a generational thing, right, that people can only speak their own truth. There's no such thing as not even objectivity, but, you know, at least the idealized pursuit of objectivity. So I had no right to tell her story because I wasn't her. And that's not the tradition of journalism that I come from, which is just everybody using the first person you know it's an attempt to try and look at an issue from all sides and kind of come to some assessment of what actually happened there i think i became aware of your story i think when i stumbled on like her thread denouncing you I don't think she waited till your article came out. Didn't she denounce you for asking her for comment? Yeah, it was it was well ahead of publication. If I remember correctly, she was soundly criticized. Well, I mean, I have to say she's blocked me, so I wasn't able to um, see a lot of this. But yeah, my feeling was that the people who did comment on it were largely sort of what I would describe as kind of woke skeptic. People like Matt Iglesias, I think, went in and, and tried to, to talk to her about it and kind of say, well, this is pretty standard journalistic practice, actually. And actually ensures a lot of fairness, which is if you put your allegations or, you know, your interpretation of events to a subject before publication, they get a chance to go, well, you've got that flatly wrong. And like, I've got the evidence to show you. If she had had any evidence that I'd got any of this wrong, I would have gladly seen it and reviewed it and changed the story appropriately. So that was a that was a real shame. But this is what I mean about I think that that wouldn't have happened in 2020. You know, that was a I think an early draft of the story described it as being like the kind of terror phase of the French Revolution where it was just that you didn't stand in the way of the the train or you got run over. And I think with the benefit of distance, you know, particularly now that there is this class of journalists who have ended up leaving their institutions and going places like Substack, there are people who feel more empowered to kind of go, no, this is perfectly normal journalistic practice. It's actually okay. And I think I was helped by the fact, you know, I've been in journalism now for getting on 20 years and I've got a pretty obvious track record of articles. People know what I'm about and my reputation and frankly, they could see the actual request that I'd made, which was pretty polite. I think that's what um, that what what prompted most of the comment was the disjunct between this. She demanded me, uh, you know, my friend started sort of sending me salty texts saying I'm literally demanding that you talk to me. She wrote, should you fuck this up, which you will, I will be on your ass like white on rice on a paper plate in a snowstorm at a KKK rally, which is a vivid metaphor or simile. Did you get accused of making mistakes in the piece? I mean, like joking aside, there is a lot of pressure when you're writing this piece because the Twitter thing hyped it. And if you had screwed up your facts in the piece, it would have been a special kind of embarrassment. 
Were you accused of getting anything wrong in the piece once it was out? I'm not aware of any formal complaint that as that anybody has has made, um, which I would have thought would have been passed on to me by you know our press team or our legal team. But you're you're right. Um, this was a, a high wire act, and if I had got it wrong, it would have been very embarrassing. But I also think that's good as a journalist. You should feel like that about every piece. Actually, you should you should really care about getting it right and feel it would be very embarrassing to get it wrong. Um, and I, you know, this is to kind of toot the horn of the Atlantic. You know, there were a lot of resources invested in in getting this right. For a start, I started writing it nearly a year ago now. You know, I was doing lots of other things in the interim, but you know, there was there was just I was given the time and space to do lots of reporting, speak to lots of people, you know, read everything there was to read. Basically, we kind of become a world expert on on everything, and and that is the only and best shield that you can have against getting things wrong is just doing loads and loads and loads of legwork and being really careful about everything. So you know, it might be there might be errors in, in, the, in it that are brought to my attention, but no, none so far. Since we're into French revolutionary metaphors now, there's this group called A Better Guggenheim, which maybe could be analogized to the Committee for Public Safety under Robespierre. Is this part of the actual Guggenheim? Well, they're interesting because they're an anonymous collective group and they would only agree to an interview request anonymously and collect. Whoa, whoa. How, <laughs> how would that work? Well, I sent emails to an, an address that was called a better Guggenheim um, and they replied, responded as a better Guggenheim. Um, you know, we flagged that up in, in the story because we want to give people an idea of who the hell is commenting. But they were, you know, very germane to the story. It was their open letters that really put a huge amount of pressure on and if you look at their website it's you know it's not some kind of crappy piece of wordpress it's a professionally produced website so they clearly had some serious resources behind them a couple of them have been named and were current or former guggenheim employees the new york post had a wild rumor that they were all white women which was denied by them and you know one of the things that's interesting is that they very firmly took the side of shadria le bouvier when she complained and and they put an instagram statement out saying they regretted having ever spoken to me um, when you know, which was a kind of surprise to me because they had been very polite and professional all the way through the interviewing and fact checking process, but I guess they must have felt pressure to be on Le Bouvier's side uh, in this particular dispute. This is a sensitive question. I have a feeling you're not going to answer it, but one thing you see in some of these disputes is that highly progressive dogma becomes a kind of enabling mechanism for antisocial personalities to vent in any way they feel like and uh and at first they get praised for you know, speaking their truth and speaking truth to power but then the scandal goes on and it becomes clear like these are troubled people and maybe they need help le bouvier seems i mean i've never met her we're not psychiatrists but like is she all there as i was reading this it, it seemed like this woman is not stable I am going to regretfully decline to speculate on someone else's mental health concerns. But what I think I would say is, you're right, there are people on the internet who, when they see a fire, their instinct is to go over and pour some petrol on it and be excited about how big the you know flames have jumped. Um, and that's a pretty unhelpful dynamic too. And I think there was a lot of, you know, I would call it kind of rubbernecking disguised as moralising. Um, that went on over this entire period, right, where people were just actually kind of loving the drama, but they were dressing it up as thinking that they were actually involved in the, in, a, in a progressive political project. So, uh, yeah, I think that's as, that's as much as I think I'd be happy to say on that, because it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's very hard to know anybody's intentions. And, and particularly when I don't think anybody is their best self on Twitter, and none of us should really be on it. And yet every day, I was I was so desperate to get off Twitter a few weeks ago, that I tongue in cheek fake my own death on Twitter as an excuse not to tweet for three days because the gag would only be funny if, if I stayed off Twitter. I went to a haunted disc golf course and it worked. But you rose after three days like Jesus. <laughs> I didn't think of it that way, but uh, I'm going to have to get that into the branding. The thing I want to close with is I'm not one of these conservatives who doesn't think privilege exists. I think privilege does exist. You know, the fact that you and I are able to spend uh, a Wednesday afternoon on a Zoom call talking about this kind of thing, you know, instead of like digging ditches or whatever shows that we're privileged. Yeah, my grandfather was a coal miner. And I always think whenever I'm tempted to complain about my job, you know what, that that gave him emphysema, which eventually killed him. So really, people being mean on Twitter has to be put in proportion. Whatever Le Bouvier experienced at the Guggenheim, I, I think any reasonable person would see her as 
racism exists, but she's still a very privileged individual to be paid to do creative work like that. You have this kicker at the end where the Guggenheim Foundation, worth more than $200 million, it's close to opening its offshoot in Abu Dhabi, a Gulf Emirate where arbitrary detention is common, freedom of the press is severely restricted, homosexuality is illegal, about 90% of the population are migrant workers, many of whom face exploitation on low wages. So they rend their garments over what a law firm concluded was a completely non-existent state of racism, or at least in regard to this one person. And, and here they are entering into this partnership with a dictatorship. I know we've been overloading listeners with analogies. Here's one more where the Catholic Church used to charge people for indulgences and they'd give money to the church and in return they'd be absolved for their sins. People have pointed out that that tradition is now getting a second wind under capitalism where you have people who are huge polluters, they're, you know, they run hedge funds, they run oil companies, but then they hashtag about Black Lives Matter or gender issues and their sins are absolved. Was the treatment of Miss Spector kind of along those lines? It's all sort of symbolic. And, and you just threw this in as a kicker. I didn't even know about this Abu Dhabi thing. The reason I write about this stuff from a perspective of somebody who sees themselves on the left is that it's like, please don't get derailed from the big injustices to the little things that are, you know, the, the near enemy, right? The narcissism of small differences. You could kick up at the person who's, you know, got a 1% better job with you, or you could question some of these much bigger issues. You know, we're just about to have a World Cup in Qatar, Football World Cup or soccer, for those of you in North America, but a place in which, you know, the British Foreign Secretary has said, you know, be very discreet to, to gay fans who are going over there. Essentially, pretend not to be gay because the football authorities decided they wanted loads and loads of money. So they're having, um, you know, an institutionally homophobic state host the, the Football World Cup. At the same time, that you know, they're all wearing rainbow armbands and stuff like that. Now, as it happens, I think going and wearing a rainbow armband in Qatar is actually a much more meaningful gesture than it is doing it in, in, in Britain. So, you know, I'm not against totally against gesture politics, but I wrote this piece in, in 2020, actually, that was basically said, cancel culture is just capitalism. You know, it's just the fact that you're going to get a diversity training. Don't spend, like, companies don't spend the money on this. Like, look at what your office cleaners are paid, you know, who are most likely to be, let's be honest, minority women, immigrant women. And, you know, are, are they being paid anything like a, a fair wage? And actually, wouldn't that be a better thing to focus on rather than a load of white people sitting in a boardroom meditating on their white fragility and navel gazing um, about about their sins? And I do, you know, I use the word sin a couple of times in this piece, exactly because I think my frame of reference is the same one that you had there. You know, the idea of papal indulgences, the idea that these big institutions like the kind of Catholic Church in the Middle Ages have this very strict morality but here are the ways in which you can buy yourself out of it it's funny you say that i was just talking to somebody who uh who works at one of canada's biggest newspapers and he was talking about the editorial direction they get from on high and the editorial direction is kind of like hey write whatever you want black lives matter is great all that stuff gender is, is a rainbow but whatever you do don't call for higher taxes that's the situation in a nutshell and you know one of the things i think is really annoying is when workplaces do these kind of hectoring things about you know why not an international pronouns day tell everybody your pronouns which is something that has got zero cost to them as a business you know actually where is the, what is the money demand on that where is the demand that anybody who's currently got power gives up a bit of it to somebody else there's absolutely none so those kind of things that i think more and more more people are kind of coming out of the woodwork to say actually we find this a bit cringe and tokenistic are often about big companies wanting to posture as doing the right thing in a way that has absolutely no downside for them whereas as you say not doing business with abu dhabi not doing business you know with um places that use uyghur labor in china all of those things have really severe costs for businesses and so as a result they'd really rather not talk about them helen lewis is a staff writer at the atlantic she spoke to me from south london you can read her article titled the guggenheim's scapegoat online or in the november 2022 print edition where it appears under the headline the scapegoat helen thanks so much for being on the quillette podcast thank you for having me Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. 